Welcome, everyone. I'm Apostle Catherine. I'm the lead pastor of Fivefold Church. You are here at Revival in the Park. And this is something very exciting that you are here because this means you are here where revival is. Where the mirac- yes, hallelujah. Where the miraculous power of God is. God chooses to use the foolish things to confound the wise to launch revival outside in a park in a small way. But every huge fire doesn't start out a huge fire. No, it begins as a small spark. Amen. God has been doing so many miracles, especially in this new year of 2021, that he is daily, even hourly, leaving us in awe with the miracles that he's been doing with the testimonies we've been receiving from people who attended revival in the park, the miracles that happened in their lives, to people across the world watching online revival in the park, as well as our live sessions throughout the week. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to share some of these testimonies with you now, that the miracles that God has done just in this past week. I want to share them to you now because God tells us to share about his good works, to make a loud noise, to shout, this is what God has done. This is how he gets the glory. When we say, this is what God did, this is the impossible thing that God did. Hallelujah. So I'm going to read some of these testimonies now, just from this past week. So these testimonies here are, are from people watching on the lives. I go live several times a week on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and here are some of their testimonies. I'm just amazed at how I'm feeling right now. Glory to God. You prayed for me and my OCD, for my OCD, and it's been a week, and I have not had one intrusive thought. Thank you. I'm free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have butterflies in my belly. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I got chills. I received. I'm floating. I'm glowing. My fingers are tingling. I'm encouraged to read my Bible so I can feel closer to God now. I feel so much peace as I'm watching. I was watching from the hospital the lives for one week. I received hope from the lies, but now I'm out of the hospital watching from home. I feel God's presence. Thank you for praying for me. I lifted my arms and started praising, and then you prayed for me. Thank you. Hallelujah. I was brought to tears. We've had three different testimonies of people being healed of cancer in the past couple weeks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From watching the lives, um, one woman... One woman shared last week, um, she asked for prayer during the life for her nephew, and the very next day he got blood test results back, and it showed um, that it went from 80% 80 cancer in his body to 0.05%. Hallelujah. And it's going to be all gone now, in Jesus' name, completely. We got another testimony this week. Um, I was also prayed for here, uh, um, and I got a PET scan done two weeks ago, and my cancer reduced by 75%, and in some areas, completely gone. Hallelujah. One person says, I felt the Lord. I had a headache. Now it's gone. Thank you so much. I felt the hand of God upon over me. I saw your video yesterday, and my arm no longer has pain. Thank you, Jesus. I felt God's presence when you were declaring health over us. I feel so much better. I started crying. Thank you. Praise God. I felt his presence and so much joy as you prayed for me. Glory to God. As soon as you started to pray, I immediately started crying, and now I'm calm. I just got chills. I feel chills on my hand. I felt my hands shaking and tears were flowing as you were praying. I felt nauseous, but now my stomach pain is gone. You prayed for me yesterday for my addiction to stop, and now I'm healed and free. Glory to God. I saw your video on YouTube of receiving the Holy Spirit and and being able to speak in tongues, and I did. I received it. Hallelujah. My hands got warm and I felt at ease. My faith is growing now. On Thursday, you prayed for someone that was having tooth pain. I was having some tooth pain and it went away. Hallelujah. 
I was watching your live about two weeks ago. I asked you to pray for my brother who was in a coma for six weeks. You did. He woke up two days later. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My headache went away as soon as you started praying. After you prayed, I felt the peace of God. Thank you for praying yesterday. My mom is feeling so much better now. I feel Jesus in my hands. I feel so much better. Thank you for praying for me. Last time you said I, that my dreams would come true, and it's true. My dreams are coming true now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Crying tears. I needed to hear this. I was struggling with condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for praying. My shingles are almost gone. I felt so light receiving the Holy Spirit. Another person testifies that you prayed, and now my cancer went 85% away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm crying hallelujah in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give God praise. This is Jesus. This is Jesus, the miracle worker. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus, and we give you all the glory, and we thank you for all the miracles you've done in every single person's lives. We thank you, Jesus, for bringing revival to us now. And we thank you, God, for the miracles you're going to do for the hungry ones here who have come, yes, who have come here physically to receive you. There is something special that God has in store for you. If God can do miracles through the live, how about you here now? Because there's something special when we gather together as believers. There's something special that happens. It touches God, God's heart because we come together as a body. And we, you know, we, we make the sacrifice to get out of the bed, to get out of the house, to, to say no to the fear of COVID, let's say. And you get in your car and you wait for parking in the parking lot. You get here early, you wait for parking, and you come in the elements. We're, lucky, we're blessed to be in L.A. where it's nice most of the time. But this touches God's heart, and there is a reward the hungry shall be filled, he says. So he sees you as hungry. He says, I'm going to fill my people today. This is a way to, to pull upon his heart, to pull upon the anointing, the power of God, is to position yourself at the church, at the house of God. Hallelujah. Who's excited? Thank you, Jesus. This message that I have for you today. I believe with all my heart will be a life-changing one for you. Freedom is in store for you in your mind today. You are going to receive freedom over your mind because you know that we are in a battle in the spiritual realm. The enemy comes after your mind. And we're on a journey for our eyes to be opened up more and more, to be completely set free from the enemy's lies. We are on this journey to, to, to one day see as Jesus sees completely. Hallelujah. No longer deceived by any lie. So today, God is breaking off a huge lie in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before Jesus came in the Old Covenant, there was no grace yet. Jesus came and brought grace. The people were slaves to sin. They were bound by the law. Condemnation and shame and guilt rules over them like a heavy yoke. It was just there. Jesus came and broke that yoke. But before Jesus came, it was there. People were living in shame and guilt and condemnation. When people sinned, many certain sins, they would be punished, punished to death. If you committed adultery, you were punished to death. You were stoned. And so this is, this is how people lived. This was the right way of doing things. People lived in this, like, I have to do this, I have to do this. I cannot sin, I have to obey the law because God says so and because I will be punished even to death if I don't. And so they're living under this weight of, like, I have to do this because I should do this. I have to do this be because I just have to. The motivation to not sin was there's no other choice. I'm forced to. 
I'm told I should. I'm judged and condemned if I do sin. So this is how people were living. This is how they were living in their lives. Like, it's, it's bondage. It's bondage. That was their motivation. Their motivation was, I don't want to be plagued even more with condemnation, shame, and guilt, even though they were plagued with that all the time because they can't live up to the, to the law perfectly. They couldn't. Jesus is the only one that gives us this grace to be able to not sin. They didn't have that grace back then. So th- they're doomed. I mean, they're, con- they li- they're going to mess up one day. And, and this is very powerful to, for you to know, to go back to see what it used to be like before Jesus came. So you can understand how different it is now and how blessed we are, this gift that Jesus gave us to be no longer slaves to, to sin. The Bible says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus that when you make Jesus Lord and you earnestly, with your heart, want to serve him, follow him, then there, there is absolutely no condemnation. Jesus will never condemn you. He'll never condemn you when you're not perfect in the moments that you mess up. He's never condemning. He's never, you should feel bad. You should feel shame. That used to be happening before. The, ju- the judgment of God was there upon people. But now there's no longer judgment. There's no longer condemnation. It's gone. And you have to understand that whatever comes from Jesus, from God, is your only truth. Not what feels right. Not what the enemy says. If Jesus says that I no longer condemn you ever, then that means that you should never condemn yourself. If he's not putting guilt upon you, you should never feel guilt yourself. Hallelujah. So now I want to explain what happened when when Jesus came on the scene. When Jesus came on the scene. So before he even paid the price that there is no longer condemnation, he first came and demonstrated this is what new life is going to be like now for you. He came and he demonstrated his love to people. And he did it in power. He found these people and all of them were, were sinning so much. But not one of them did he come and, and be disappointed with. Not one of them did he come and say, you should have known better. But I suppose I can give you a second chance. There was no hint of judgment at all in him. He would see people demon-possessed. And when you're demon-possessed, that means that you're sinning, like, the most because you're really, like, bound by the enemy, just led by the enemy. So whether you're saying mean things to people, doing mean things to people, uh, being a horrible example for people, uh, uh, abusing your body, You know, whatever it is you're doing, when you're possessed by the devil, you're doing really bad sins, okay? But there was this woman, this adulterer, she committed adultery. And there's a story in the Bible where the Pharisees, who they were the godly people, the Christians of that day, the people who followed God, not Christians, but the, the people of God, the people in the church. They would, they would be the people in church today. They see this woman, and they're ready to stone her. So they're full of judgment, like, you are so awful. How could you do this? Now you deserve to die. They were so self-righteous. But that picture of what they were doing is a picture of how they would feel about themselves too. That was their truth, that if you do bad things, shame, judgment, condemnation is upon you. You deserve it. That's where their mind was at. That reflected what they were doing to her, reflected what was going on for even themselves. But Jesus comes and he says, you who have sinned here, you who who haven't sinned at all, if anybody here who hasn't sinned at all, you can throw the first stone. And they all knew they weren't perfect. 
They all themselves would feel condemnation and guilt all the time, so they couldn't throw a stone at her. And Jesus says to her, go and sin no more. Now it's important how we understand how Jesus interacted with her, this whole situation. He comes full of love, like rescuing his daughter, showing, I don't judge you. I don't condemn you. I love you. I have compassion and understanding for you, and I have mercy. Look at this amazing love. And she, that, that encounter that she had with him, she was having this encounter with God, with the power of God. And in that moment, she was changed. She had never encountered a love like this. And when Jesus says, now go and sin no more, you have to understand that he was saying, now go and sin no more with love. It was like, now that you have received my love so powerfully, now you see me rightly. Now you're able to be in relationship with me. Now you are going to have the power and grace and ability to follow the things of the spirit, not of the flesh. So go and sin no more. That's how it was. It wasn't, okay, I got you this time, but seriously, you better not go sin no more. No, no. And it's important we read the Bible correctly with the revelation of the Holy Spirit, not the revelation of, of religion. The spirit of religion, the spirit of religion, meaning void of grace. The spirit of religion, meaning how the Pharisees were operating. How you have to do this, you have to do this, you can't heal on the Sabbath. Um, You should feel guilt, you should feel bad about what you did. You should pray this amount of time, you should read this amount of a Bible, or you're not being a good Christian you shouldn't have church in a park. You should have it in a building this this way. Like all of these rules, for example, that is an example of spirit of religion that is alive today still. The same spirit that the devil was, was, was uh, put inside the Pharisees that were condemning Jesus, that were looking for his faults, that were not looking with open hearts. Oh, who is this new person? person claiming to be a prophet and son of God, not with an open heart, but instant. They're wrong. They're wrong. Judge, 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 condemn. That was a specific spirit that the enemy put in the Pharisees. So that same spirit is alive today. It's the en- one of the enemy's favorite ways to blind people. Because what it does is it keeps people in bondage as if Jesus never came. So they worship Jesus, but they live the lifestyle of the Pharisees under the old covenant. You've heard, you've heard of, Christianity by and large has gotten a bad rep by a lot of people in the world because of so much judgment that's come upon other people. All that is, is it's the same exact spirit that was working through those Pharisees trying to stone the the woman. That's the same exact spirit that the enemy speaks to people's minds saying, this is God. This is how it should be. You should judge. The enemy playing to be God. People think they're so convicted, just like the Pharisees were so convicted that Jesus was using the devil's powers, it says in the Bible. Right? So it's so important when we read the Bible that we read it with the proper revelation, not the, not the spirit of religion. And there have been maybe teachings you've received from religious teachers before. That you have to be very open for God to empty yourself. Empty, empty you out. Empty wrong doctrines that were taught to you. Apostle Paul warns of this. Apostle Paul warns to people, he says, I taught you the doctrine of Jesus, the, the true gospel. But there's other teachers here that are teaching you something different. Protect the true gospel that I preach to you. So that's the same way how it is today. And this is one of the roles of an apostle, by the way, and why they're necessary, is 
is, is God gives them this grace to see, I see how the devil's afflicting people. I see there's a wrong theology in here. There's a spirit of religion over people's minds. They need to be free of that. Eyes need to be opened up. So what, what we're dealing, we need, we need apostles of today to see what's going on today. What the devil, how the devil is trying to blind people today. To speak of rhema, which means present tense word of God today. To free you today. That's why we need living pastors today. Not just the pastors that were in the Acts church, but also living apostles, living prophets, living evangelists, and living teachers. So, in Apostle Paul's time, he came to people preaching Jesus fresh. This is Jesus. This is grace. There is no longer condemnation. And when, 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 when people encounter Jesus, just like the woman, the, the woman who committed adultery, oh, they really met him. There's no veil anymore. They met him face to face. There is intimacy there. They can really see this amazing love. It's like falling in love with a human times a million. Like, when you, when you can really see Jesus, when you have a true encounter, like they did face to face when he first came on the scene, you're intoxicated. You see nothing else. You don't want to sin anymore. You don't, the, the desires not, are not even there because you're so intoxicated because the love is so big and amazing for you. When we read the Bible, when Jesus was introducing himself to people, when he was healing them, when he was delivering them, when he would speak a prophetic word to them like the Samaritan woman at the well. The Bible says how they receive the miracle and they follow Jesus. And it's funny, you don't find find the Bible mentioning that people were really struggling, struggling in sin. But they're, like the disciples, the, 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 the 12 disciples, they're fishermen, they're tax collectors. Jesus quickly encounters them. They have an encounter, a true encounter with him. See how amazing his love is. And they leave everything. They leave their jobs. They leave everything. And they just follow him. And he says in the word, to be my disciple, you must leave everything and, and come follow me. And they have no problem doing that. They just do it. Were they more special than you are today? No. But they had a true encounter with Jesus. They encountered the power of God, which reveals his amazing love. Prior to this in the old covenant, people weren't having encounters with God, seeing him face to face. There was a veil. So it was more like, okay, God, I know we're supposed to do this because God says so. I believe in God. I believe in God. But they didn't know His amazing love. Jesus tore the veil, comes to them face to face, demonstrates his love with power, healed, delivered. And they were sinning, doing all bad things. He's just like, I want to free you. I want to heal you. I don't care all that you've done. I just want to free you. I want you to know my love. I love you so much. And in that one encounter, they had met him they were changed forever and so now now things have changed now it's not okay well I'm not going to sin because God says I shouldn't I know I shouldn't and and I don't want to feel guilt so I I don't want judgment to come on me so I'm not I'm going to try to not sin now everything has changed now it is All I can see is Jesus. I'm so amazed by him. His love is so amazing. All I can think about is how I can say thank you. How I can, I have to surrender now. I have to get on my knees now and surrender. I can't. Jesus, how can I serve you? How can I please you? I love you. Your love is amazing. How can I serve you more? How can, take my life. Like this is what happens when you really encounter the the true love of God. And 
And this is how it's supposed to be. When you can see rightly, all you can see, you're intoxicated. You don't, you can't, the sin has no power anymore. It's just Jesus, Jesus. All I can think is Jesus. And as you fill your life with Jesus, there's no room for all the other stuff of the world. Your life is filled. Hallelujah. So what I'm preaching today is my true life. My biggest passion, my biggest passion on this earth is to see you, to see you have an encounter with the living Jesus, to encounter his power. Whether you are healed, whether you are set free, whether you receive a prophetic word where God speaks directly to your heart, things you haven't even told anybody, revealing that he's been with you, Revealing his amazing love for you. The prophetic word that comes to you is full of love, not shame, not condemnation. All of the, all the things that God chose to say, he chose to speak such amazing love to you. It reveals his love. The power of God is so precious. The power of God is what's needed to truly see how much Jesus loves you. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. There's no kingdom of God if there's no power of God where miracles are happening. That's a bold statement, but it's the Bible. It's not the kingdom of God. It's religion. It's preaching Jesus, but living in bondage and religion, no power of God. So me, I grew up Christian my entire life. I gave my life to Jesus when I was four years old, I remember, in my living room. There wasn't a day I didn't believe in God, and I always loved God. But I was in religion. I had never encountered the power of God. I didn't know how to have a friendship with God. I didn't know how to talk to God. I didn't want to ever read the Bible. I loved him, but I I was lukewarm. When I became a teenager, I opened up doors, stepped into the world, drank, did things with guys, um, dishonored my temple of the Holy Spirit, lived selfishly, one foot in the world. I still loved God. I never not believed in him, one foot in the world, lukewarm. I moved to L.A. in 2013 in my early 20s. Once I came to L.A., a hunger in me arose. Like, I, I had this feeling that, that there was more of God and I wanted to find him. So that hunger led me to one day going to this little tiny house church where a prophet was ministering. At that time, I didn't know that prophets existed today. But a prophet was ministering. He was anointed. He carried the true power of God. There was just like 40 people in this little living room. And he prayed for people and they received healing. He prayed for people and demons manifested and were cast out of people. I had never seen this before in my life. And then he spoke a prophetic word to me. This is the first time I received prophetic ministry. And I was worried about certain things in my life, about my future, and he, that day specifically. And he spoke that, that, that I should not, that God had a perfect plan that everything was going to be okay. He spoke directly to my heart what was going on with me that day. And that one little prophetic word changed my life completely. That one little prophetic word was me seeing Jesus face to face, was me seeing for the first time how amazing his love is. A month later, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues. And that encounter, those encounters, those quick, quick encounters of the power, with the power of God made me fall in love with Jesus for the first time. Made me want to surrender. For so long, I knew I was supposed to surrender, and I wanted to. I knew I was supposed to read the Bible, and I wanted to. I knew I was supposed to spend alone time with God, 
and I wanted to, but I wasn't, but I couldn't. I don't know what was wrong with me. And every day I felt shame and condemnation. Every day didn't open up the Bible. You didn't open the Bible again today. Shame, shame, condemnation. Didn't open the Bible again today. Shame, condemnation. You're still drinking. You're still having one foot in the world. Shame, condemnation. Every day. And I want to tell you something today. That feeling guilt never led me to repentance. It never did. Out of the 15 or so years that I had one foot in the world, or 10 years that I had one foot in the world, what led me to repentance was the kindness of God. The Bible says the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Not just hearing about God's kindness but having an encounter with the living God who reveals his kindness to you. That is what happened. The prophetic word. Seeing the the prophet pray to other people and them just crying. Seeing, oh my goodness, God's love is amazing. Oh my goodness, God doesn't shame and condemn these people. He doesn't shame or condemn me. But the way that these people are crying, God's love is way more amazing than I realized. What? I think, I think God, I, I, I was reflecting on, 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 on when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and I was just moved to surrender to God completely. I give you my entire life, Jesus. You can do what you want with it. You can change my plans. You can give me new plans. Every, I give you my life, Jesus. Surrender to him. And I got emotional thinking last night of I'm so grateful that that he never condemned me when I knew better. You know, that he, 10 years, I had one foot in the world. I was knowingly sinning again and again and again and again and again and again. But in that moment, he didn't choose to bring that up. He didn't choose to say, you should have known better, but I guess I'll give you a second chance, maybe. Maybe. But he chose, this is how Jesus was. He was like, my daughter, you've just never really encountered me before, my daughter. It's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. You really need to know my kindness first. You need to know my love first for you to have the power to be able to repent. My daughter, that's all gone. There's no shame There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. I'm not judging that you knowingly sinned as being a Christian, even though you had amazing Christian parents. I'm not judging you one bit. I just needed you to really meet me. And now you've met me. And now you can repent. Now you can sin no more. Sin no more, my daughter. As he said to the woman committing adultery. Sin no more. You have the power now to sin no more. Hallelujah. It's Romans 2.4 that says, God's kindness leads you to repentance. The Passion Translation says, Do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance? The true power of God opens your eyes to God's love, makes it so you can really see his love, receive his love, and fall in love with him. And it also brings the fear of God. The fear of God. 
not being afraid of God. I'm not meaning that. But the fear of God means reverence and respect for God. So in that moment when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit where I was receiving this power coming upon me, I felt so reverent and fearful of God for the first time. Not afraid, but reverent. I felt like, I felt my eyes just opened up to see how big he was and how almighty he is and how tiny I am. Like, all of a sudden, this revelation came. Who am I to think I know what's best for my life? Who am I to not surrender? The Being in the presence where the power of God was moving made me be able to see and encounter God's love and brought the fear of God to me. This is how it's supposed to be. We can't repent without, without the power of God. We don't have the power. They did not have the power in the old covenant. So when we read the Bible, you have to read it with this lens. When it says, don't take the grace of God lightly. Don't continue sinning. When it's speaking of that, Paul is not speaking to Christians, most Christians of today who actually haven't encountered the power of God. Otherwise, I would have been judged hardcore for how I lived for 10 years. But he was speaking to people who actually have encountered the power of God. And that's who I'm speaking to today. And the most people, when they do encounter the power of God, most people do have the hearts the hearts to follow God and please him. Most people do. There's some rare ones who, who harden their hearts, who j- just don't have a heart to follow God, don't pl- to please God, but they maybe they don't want to go to hell, so they say, I'm a Christian or something. But that's not most of you. That's not you here. That's not you here. And so we're called to preach the good news. Amen. We're not called to bring, we're not called to preach sh- shame and guilt. You better not take God's grace for granted. I'm telling you that when you can just have this encounter and when you can have this heart of, God, I want to follow you, I want to please you, He will help you. He will help you. You will be in His will. You won't, you won't sin no more. And I'm speaking from my life. I told you that for so many years, I wanted to open my Bible, but I wasn't. I was living halfway in the world, going out partying most days of the week, and going to church twice a week, and leading worship even. That's how I was living. And I wanted to stop. But when I encountered the power of God, that anointing fed me. Like, anointing, which means the power of God, like, that's what's what's flowing here. That's why some of you, you, you feel like coming alive as you hear the message or you, you cry as you hear the message because you're not just hearing words, but the power of God is coming and touching your spirit, coming and feeding your spirit, fanning it into flame. So when your spirit can actually be fanned into flame, now natural desires come. I don't want church to end. I can't wait for the next revival in the park. I want to open up my Bible. Jesus' love is so amazing. I want to read his word. I want to talk with him. I want to worship him. I want to serve him. I want to serve in the church. I want to do whatever he wants me to. These desires naturally come. This is what happened to me. When I encountered the power of God, it was instant. All of a sudden, I'm praying in the spirit in my car all the time. All of a sudden, I don't even want to watch a movie that's not about God. I'm just wanting to talk about God all the time. I can't take my eyes off of Jesus because I'm so in love, so intoxicated with him. Now I, I, I'm, I'm turning down my social engagements when before I was addicted to them so I wouldn't be home alone. Now I'm turning them all away and I'm spending time in the word. I'm spending alone time with God because I'm seeing God rightly. Because I'm seeing him like, I'm not judging how you pray. I'm not judging the amount of, uh, of chapters of the Bible you read. I'm just here to be with you and I love you. I'm here for you to receive my love, my child. When you can see him rightly, that's all you want to do. 
But when you see him with the lens of religion, you didn't, you, you missed reading the Bible this today. I don't think you're praying right. You're not saying enough words. Those, those thoughts go through your head and, and come on, when those thoughts go through your head, that's making you afraid of God. This is a relationship with Jesus. When, you, when, you, when you're in love with your husband, with your wife, or you have a really close friend, all you want to do is spend time with them and you miss them when they're not around. Because you can depend on their never-ending love. You can depend that they'll never judge you, that even when you make a mess up, they, they understand. They won't blame you. They love you still. It's okay. We all make mistakes. It's okay. Right? Like that. So you need to see God that way, not of the lens of religion, but you need to see him rightly. Now you can be free, full of peace and joy, not running from God, but running to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I know you're being set free today. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Um, it was never the voice of condemnation that led me to open up my Bible. But it was encountering God's love that led me to do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, um, bless those who... Luke 6, 27, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Luke 6, 35 says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. We have to remember that these commands, love your enemies. Bless them when they curse you. Those commandments to us is God saying, be like me. God is not a hypocrite. <laughs> if he says, bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Forgive 77, 77 times, tons and tons and times. This is a picture of God for you. You've been an enemy to God, or you've been an enemy by living one foot in the world. He still loves you. It says in there, be merciful as your father is merciful. You haven't treated him the best, but he still blessed you. Bless those who curse you. That's powerful. That's the picture of your father. Hallelujah. So I want to I wanna end now by sharing how to, how to accurately repent how God wants you to. Like in those moments in your life, how to in those moments in your life where God wants to take you higher, wants to make you more like him, we're on this journey from now until eternity. We still got work to do, amen? And we should never be ashamed of that. We should be real about it. Yep, I'm a work in progress. God's aware of that. He's not disappointed that we're perfect yet. No. Um, so you have to know how to hear God God's voice of conviction leading you to repentance. You have to know how to hear this if you want to transform and to look like Jesus. Because if you're hearing the wrong voice, if you're hearing condemnation and guilt, you're not going to change. You can't. There's no power in that. The Bible says the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Remember, there was no power in the old covenant for them to repent. They had no power. The voice of condemnation and guilt does not give you power. But only the love of Jesus, hearing his voice accurately. When, when you 
have a friend, let's say a friend of yours, a really good friend of yours, has a problem showing up on time, and they just struggle with it. It's a weakness that they haven't, that they're still dealing with. They have to bring you to the airport, and they end up being kind of late, and it makes you, you end up missing your flight because of that. But this friend is your dearest friend. You love them so much. This friend is an amazing person. They just have a little weakness like we all do, right? They just made a mistake. Maybe it's not the only time they made that mistake, but they have the, this weakness they're working on, right? Okay, so this is a really genuine, amazing person, amazing friend. And you're there at the airport, and you see they missed their flight, and this, per- this friend is just crying, feeling so much guilt, feeling so, so upset. Their day's ruined. They feel so bad because they love you so much, and it hurts them so much what they did, what they caused to happen. Do you want your friend to feel that way? Do you want your friend to feel guilt? No. Amen? A good, if you're a good friend, you don't want them to feel guilt. You'll be like, it's okay. It's okay. I love you. I love you. I know you're sorry, but I don't want you your day to be ruined. I don't want you to feel guilt about this. Thank you for saying you're sorry. It's okay. I love you. Amen? Okay. I share that example because you need to understand how God sees you. When you when you make a mistake, when you mess up, a lot of people have this wrong doctrine that guilt is a good thing because it leads you to now want to repent. That is wrong. That's a lie of the enemy. This is a spirit of religion trying to keep you in bondage and make you now judge other people. That's what's going on there. God never wants you to feel guilt. This is how he wants it to be. For you, you met Jesus. You encountered his love. And when you do that, you truly, genuinely want more than anything to please him, to touch his heart. You you genuinely want that. And when that's your heart, most of the time you're going to touch his heart and please him and make him so proud. And in, that, in a moment where you mess up, where you make a mistake, if you love God, that hurt, it can sting. And that guilt can, can come. But God's saying, it's okay. God wants you to recognize what you did wrong, say sorry genuinely, and see God rightly. See him in that moment like you were to that friend. It's okay. I love you. I love you. It's okay. You need to see God in that moment. I love you. It's okay. Come here. Come here. Don't run with shame like Adam and Eve did and hide yourself. Come here in my arms. I love you. I love you. I love you. And when you can see God rightly, it's like a human on earth that you love so much. So let's say the, 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 the airport thing. Because you're a good person and you love your friend a lot, you, the, your, your lateness issue caught up with you. And it was kind of this convicting moment for you where it's like, man, I really love my friend and I don't want to hurt them again or other people. So I'm going to work harder on this. I'm going to set more attention to this. Like I'm going to do extra here. I'm going to make myself more aware. Like this is something I need to work extra on. Okay, yeah, I'm going to do this now. Okay, thank you, friend, for understanding. You're so amazing. Thank you. And then you work on it, right? Amen? So with God, this is how he wants it to be. He wants it to be like you recognize what you did wrong, but don't. That, that guilt and shame voice will come from the enemy like, ah, oh, look what you did. Dismiss that completely. No, that's not truth. No, that's not God. And look at God rightly with his arms wide open. Accepting your apology and just embracing you and saying, it's okay, it's okay. So you say, I'm sorry, God. You mean it with your heart. 
and you use this as a teachable moment to now become more aware in your mind. Okay, there is this little weakness here I did. I'm going to set more attention here so that won't happen again because I really, I only want to please God. I only want to touch his heart. So when you do it this way, when you receive his conviction with love accurately, now you have the power and ability. God gives you the strength and the ability to do better, to not sin again, to not make the mistake again. Because you're doing it the right way, repenting because of the kindness of God in the new covenant. Hallelujah. There will be two different times, types of condemnation that may come in your life. One of them is complete, complete lie, random lie, out of nowhere, devil just trying to plant this, devil trying to make you think you're doing wrong when you're not. I'll give you an example. When I, I had to be delivered of religion. When I was called to be an apostle, I was like, what? I don't think I pray the right way or long enough. I don't think I read enough of the Bible. Uh, on top of, I had no clue how to preach, and public speaking was my biggest fear. But so when God called me to be an apostle, I had to really battle those voices in my head that were really the spirit of religion. I would have spirit of religion voices saying, you're not reading your Bible enough. Because the spirit of religion lie was saying, to be a good Christian, you have to read the Bible at least one chapter every single day. Some random religious lie, right? Or you're not praying enough. I was doing what God was calling me to do, working hard for him, making all these videos, and I was spending time in the word. But it didn't look like that religious voice wanted. It didn't look the same. So for me, I had to, I had to really be free of the spirit of religion, really identify this voice of condemnation is this random thing coming out of nowhere. There's, absolute, it's, there's, there's, there's nothing that needs to be repented of in my life in that area that it's saying. I don't need to read the Bible more. It's just saying, it's just trying to lie to me, you're supposed to read it this kind of way, religion. Amen? Like how you can't heal people on the Sabbath. See, religion has these rules you have to follow. Right? Amen? Okay, then there will be another voice of condemnation that will come. And sometimes that will come when you, when you have a door open in your life of sin, of a mistake. So there's no truth to the condemnation at all. But there is a conviction of God going on here. Where he wants you to repent as you see his loving conviction. Amen? And when you do that, you close the door of that nagging condemnation voice. Amen? There's no truth to that condemnation voice ever. But sometimes it can become so nagging. And there's a way to, to, to stop that by closing the door. But you need to understand that when that condemnation voice comes, and it comes because that door is open, do not make your condemnation and guilt lead you to repentance because the repentance won't last. That's not where the power is, amen? But you need to identify, okay, God, I hear your loving voice of conviction. I'm saying no to this condemnation voice. I'm going to do what you want me to do, God. And that vicious attack will stop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, one time, one time I, I was um, in a wilderness season. I was in a wilderness season in my calling. And I was working so hard for God. I was doing what he was calling me to do and working long hours. But in this wilderness season, I got a little tired because it was the wilderness. I wasn't seeing like fruit of my labors yet because it wasn't harvest time yet. And 
I started working a little bit less. I was still working a lot, but it was just less. I needed to renew my mind about this wilderness season to take courage that God was working out all things for the good, that he was testing my faith, that I needed to keep going, that, that, that God was blessing the work of my hands even though I'm not seeing it right away. But it's going to come. But because I, 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 I needed to renew my mind more in that and I wasn't enough, voice of condemnation started to come, you're not working enough. Voice of the devil, you're not seeing fruit. It's been years. You're not seeing fruit because you're not doing enough. You're not working enough. And I battled with, is this conviction from God? Now I know it's not. Amen? The condemnation voice is never the conviction of God. How conviction of God would look like, it's gentle and it's loving. If you have an open heart to please him, it will look like you going to the word of God. A scripture popping up about, I will bless the work of your hands. And then, you come here to Revival in the Park, and what I'm teaching on has to do with if you don't sow a seed, you'll, you won't see anything. You have to do something. And I'm preaching with love, amen. I'm not preaching with spirit of religion. Like, you got to go to work and I'm going to see anything. Right, amen? It's important that we preach with love, that we release the word of God with love. So I, I preach, I preach when you sow seeds, this is a principle in the spiritual realm, that when you sow, then God can bless the work of your hands. God pours the supernatural power of God on the seed, and one day it's going to crop up and be the supernatural fruit and harvest in your life. Amen? And you're sitting here, and you're like, wow, I just read the scripture in the Bible about God will bless the work of my hands. And I'm not doing a lot lately. I, I, I totally have a lot of free time right now. And I heard that. Oh, I think God is saying, I need to work harder. I need to work more. Do you see how this conviction was with love? There was no shame or guilt or condemnation in that. It was all gentle and with love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I was hearing that condemnation voice, you're not working enough, you're not working enough, you're not working enough, I was drained. I was the most tired in my life. But when my eyes had first opened up to Jesus' love, I had supernatural energy to work and to be joyful. Like I was this light to people, full of joy. And I was working hard, harder than I've ever worked in my life and enjoying it. I never enjoyed to work. Working sometimes till five in the morning. I was like, this is supernatural. It was because I was seeing God's love rightly. His anointing power of God was working in me, energizing me. So this repentance is so, such with ease. Come this way. And it's such with ease. Amen? But when you hear that voice of condemnation, like that one time I had, I had this moment of forgetting. Condemnation. I felt so tired, so drained. So this is why you cannot listen to guilt and condemnation ever. It's never a cue. Okay, I need to change my ways. You need to learn how to listen to God's loving voice of conviction. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say, God never condemns me. Jesus loves me so much. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know you have been free today in your mind. I know you have been free forever. And I declare just lift your hands to God now. I declare protection to you. I declare protection to you. I declare protection from religious spirit out there. What I'm sharing is rare. This religion has become, it's what we're used to lately. But this truth of this Jesus' truth is rare. I declare protection upon you that nothing can take what you've received today. I declare you are changed forever. 
You are changed forever. I declare condemnation has no power over you anymore in Jesus' name. I declare every condemning thought to leave, every guilt to leave in Jesus' name, every voice of shame to leave in Jesus' mighty name. I declare you are free now. The devil can never deceive you again. I declare in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and some of you, as you were listening, you, you're listening to my story and you're, you're, you're feeling inside, I want to have that encounter. I want to have that encounter with the power of God like she's talking about. I hear God saying, I want to have that encounter with you right now. I want to touch you right now in power. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands now. Close your eyes. Put your eyes upon him now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I declare this anointing to touch every single one of you now in Jesus' name. Receive his power right now. Everyone online, receive his power. Receive this anointing, this touch of God right now that will change you forever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I see there's some, some people here and online who were craving the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I see you craving it now, and that's God moving in you, saying, I want to give this to you now. I just need your surrender, and I will baptize you with my spirit. I release the baptism of the Holy Spirit to you now. Receive his spirit. Receive his spirit now. Let him overtake your tongue. Don't be shy. Don't be quiet. Just start praising God, everybody right now. Just start praising God with your, with your mouth. Thank him. He's here right now. Just say, I love you, God. Speak, speak from your heart. I love you, God. I praise you, Jesus. I love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just speak with your own words. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just surrender and allow him to overtake you. I see his spirit touching you with fire. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and touching us in power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for revealing your love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for making it easy, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for making it natural, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Every single person here who needs freedom in their mind, God is going to free you right now. There's some of you here who have anxiety and depression that God is going to free right now. I speak every single spirit of anxiety to get out now in Jesus' name. Every spirit of depression to go now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. People who are having recurring nightmares at, at, at night, I declare them to go, to stop now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody's here is being attacked, like a panic attack in their mind, out of nowhere. Thoughts which come from the enemy. Thoughts that are saying, give up. It's hopeless. You're, you won't make it. These kinds of negative thoughts just overtake you. You feel like you can't control them. God is freeing you right now. I declare that spirit of panic attack, that lying attack spirit to get out now in Jesus' name. Be free now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Every sickness here, I declare to leave every body now. Go now. Be healed 
completely now in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. I speak pain in your bodies, pain to leave now in Jesus' name. Headache, get out and go now in Jesus' name. Stomach issues, someone has stomach issues. God is healing you now. Be healed now in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.